Well, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. As we continue to walk through this gospel, we are in verse number 5, and we'll be reading the account of the birth of John the Baptist being foretold from verses 5 all the way to verse 25. But I want to tell you that we will be in that section of Scripture for several weeks. There is um, a lot to be said from that passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, and I honestly could not think of a more fitting song to sing in light of what we're getting ready to talk about. O church, arise. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Let's pray together. Lord, we recently sang what... My prayer is, and I pray that each of our prayer actually is, that we need you every hour. And we need you. I need you to preach. I need you to use me as a mouthpiece. I I need you, and the only way that people will be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ is if it's not of me, but all of you. 
And I know, God, that the hearer needs you as well. Because there's plenty of other things we can concentrate on, think about, prepare for. But Lord, would you do a work in each of us so that we are ready to hear from you today. Bring glory to yourself through our delight in your word. Would you work inside of us a true smile in our soul about your truth? For your glory, we pray. Conform us into the image of your Son. We pray that you would even save, bring salvation to those who do not know you today. In Jesus' name, amen. This text and the reason for several weeks of exploring this text is because in this text, as I make a a note of things that we could talk about from this text that I just read to you, we could talk about the attributes of God clearly seen in this text, and in the days to come we will. We could talk about the attributes of man. They're clearly seen in this text. A man who doubts, people who struggle, people who live in dark times, religious corruption, political chaos. We could talk about that. We could also talk about this issue of a visitation of God. Some refer to it as revival. We could also talk about repentance. John the Baptist will come preaching, repent, turn. We could talk about prayer, and we will. Because Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed, and the angel said, The Lord has heard your prayer. We could talk a lot about prayer. We could talk a lot about doubt in the Christian life because Zechariah doubted that the words were actually believable. We could talk about angels, and we will, about angels. Fun fact, the last time that the angel Gabriel was ever in the scriptures was in Daniel chapter 9. You you may want to go back and look at that last time Gabriel spoke up because Zechariah is saying, well, how will I know this will be? And the first thing that the angel says is, I'm Gabriel. That is a very important statement that goes back to Daniel chapter 9. We could talk about, obviously, the sovereignty of God over the womb. And it is God's pleasure to put a life in the womb of a woman. We could talk about Christian living and how Zechariah and Elizabeth, in a world gone crazy in that particular time, were very faithful to live out their faith in Jehovah God. We could talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit is filling John the Baptist from birth. Extraordinary truths. I mean, there's no way to tackle every one of these in one sermon. There's no way. And so we're not going to try. But today, I I want to talk to you. We'll concentrate our time. We'll walk through the text. I'll give you some information that I think will be helpful for our weeks to come. But the the driving force today of what we want to talk about is in the statement of verse number 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. That's, first of all, the, the one spot. And then this coming or visitation that says in verse number 17, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, and then we're going to run towards making a people ready for the Lord. Now with that in mind, I want to give you some background information here because as we walk through the text, if you were to make some notes about what's going on here, we 
we learn about some of the characters in our text. First of all, he says that it's in the days of Herod, king of Judea. So that lets us know who's politically in charge. It's a man named Herod, referred to often as Herod the Great. And keep in mind that God has been silent for 400 years. Now, when we say silent, we mean nothing written on the pages of Scripture since Malachi. That's 400 years from the time of Malachi to the gospel writings. 400 years. Four centuries have passed. And keep in mind also that this is a time of godlessness, ungodly living, great hypocrisy among religious leadership. And the interesting thing is that old Herod here, also known as Herod the Great, is a guy who tells people that he is, first of all, a descendant of Esau. He claims Jewish heritage, Jewish lineage, but he's an Edomite. And the only reason that he says that he's part of the Jewish race is so that he can benefit from some kind of connection to the Jews. The only reason he wants connection with the Jews is if he finds that it can be selfish gain. It's the only reason. He beautified the temple for the Jews, but one of the things that he placed on it was a Roman eagle. He had it over the entrance, and that was also the same guy, Herod, who not too far from the temple, was pagan temples. So he didn't have really a a desire for one true God. He just thought that deities and the religious connection of toleration to all of them would be politically expedient for him. He was such a wicked guy that he not only had multiple marriages, but he even is wrote about as killing one of his sons because he thought that he would take his throne. And this was actually four days before Herod actually died himself that he had one of his sons put to death. You will remember that this same Herod is the one who later would order in Matthew chapter 1, 16 through 18, the massacre of all Jewish boys under the age of two so that the next... Um, uh, person on the throne would not be some Jew taking the seat of Herod. And so he advocated the killing in a, in a honestly a futile attempt to kill our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, when there was such a rage that um, when the wise men visited and said, we're looking for the one who is born king of the Jews, this did not set well. With Herod. So, this is not a good time in history. It's corrupt. It's difficult. It's politically messy. It is religiously confused because of the hypocrisy from the top. But here comes this man we meet named Zechariah. Zechariah's name in itself and the meaning of the word is very interesting. The word Zechariah means Yahweh has remembered. What a fitting name. Yahweh has remembered. And we learn from the text that Zechariah is a priest. He's a priest who is noted as his divisions. Now these divisions, by the way, if you were to take the time to go back and look at 1 Chronicles 24, you would find out that David, King David, There were so many priests that he began to make these divisions of the priests so that they would share the load and the responsibility in the temple. And he is, Zechariah is of this, what would be considered the eighth of the divisions under Abijah. He's the eighth of these divisions. So you could look at it like this. It's not really that they were working a swing shift, but they would work in shifts. The priest would work in the priestly duties at the temple in shifts. But what was so interesting in Zechariah's day was in Zechariah's day there was around 20,000 estimated priests from the line of Aaron. And so they would choose by lot, just by a drawing of straws, if you will, 
Who would be doing the altar of incense? Now, a little bit about the altar of incense, where he was when the, when the angel appeared to him. The hour of incense was for this reason, that any offering that would go up to the Lord in the sacrificial system would go up to the Lord as a sweet aroma. So there would be an hour for incense before the offering and after the offering. And the notion was that the offerings going up to the Lord of that pure male offering sacrificed would be enveloped in a sweet aroma to God. And the likelihood of Zechariah being chosen for that was a a once-in-a-lifetime thing most commentators would agree because it was chosen by a lot. There's so many priests, and they just say, you get to pick, and after you've been picked, you don't get to be picked again. You have other duties. And so it would be a, a random, very unusual occasion, which has the providence of God all over it, which is for another sermon on the attributes of God. And the fact that God would choose him to do this and no one else and designed on purpose. So Zechariah is this noted as a godly guy married to a woman named Elizabeth, another interesting name. Elizabeth, the meaning is, my God is my oath. Now that doesn't mean that everybody lives up to their name's meaning. But it is significant that the meaning of these names just drive the story that much stronger. Elizabeth and Zechariah are righteous before God. They walk blamelessly. They're older, but they have no children. Elizabeth is even a descendant of Aaron. And by the way, this is significant too, because Zechariah is not looking for a wife outside of what God has ordained for him. He's looking for a wife inside the Aaron line. Inside, those who are like-minded have the same duties, have the same responsibilities. So it's a beautiful marriage. But they have no children, and they're advanced in years. And so we can already see that this wonderful couple who does everything for the Lord has no children, and we can conclude already that God's ways are not our ways. Because every one of us, if we're, if we're running things from heaven's throne, are giving children to those who love the Lord Jesus and are faithful to Him, and we're making sure that they have children, they're not barren, and we make sure that all those who hate God are barren. But God's ways are not our ways. And so this continues, and you, you can read the account of of Zechariah and, and him doubting what the angel comes and says and, and saying, how will I know this will come to pass? And what will John the Baptist be doing? And, and what will his role be? And I could go into a lot more detail today, but I really would rather have a little plane ride over top of this text because we're going to go into the minutia of it in the next few weeks. And this is what I want to hit on today is this setup of in the days of Herod. 400 years had passed, and Zechariah and Elizabeth are doing what many God-fearing people, many God-fearing people are doing in that day. They are longing for God to come. They are longing for Messiah to show up. They are wanting the Deliverer to come. 400 years, no prophet has spoken. 400 years, the sacrificial system continues. And the last words, if you'll turn with me now to Malachi. The last words of Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 4. Verse number 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. 
The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Listen to this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of other destruction. They're longing for the day when God would act. Verse number 3. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are 400 years after this moment. And they are still looking forward to the Lord acting. It does not mean that God took his hands off of the wheel of creation for 400 years. It just simply means that as far as revealed words spoken through the prophets, there is none. And can you imagine 400 years of the people of God praying for Messiah to come? God, please visit us, act Speak to us. Come to us. Growing up in church all of my life, we would have on regular occasions revivals. This was the word that was used. Revivals. And you would have a week's worth of preaching and you're, you're, I think the intent was pure for, for people to actually have a rekindled sense of God's presence, of His power, of His, of His holiness. I'm not saying that they were ill-intended at all. But this text right here that we're looking at today, if there's ever been a time when there was a true faithful remnant of God who says, God... Would you please come and visit us? And by the way, in the incarnation, from the forerunner John the Baptist, in the incarnation, that is definitely God coming and visiting us in the flesh. And the people are to be prepared for this coming. That's what John the Baptist is there for, to make a people prepared for the Lord. And they would say, come and visit us. But when I was growing up, true revival would oftentimes be nothing more than what I would say is not a true revival. It would be a superficial, emotional response that usually resulted in a temporary experience, but no long-term fruit of righteousness. True revival, according to Ian Murray in his book, Revival and Revivalism, true revival is when the living God sovereignly and powerfully breaks into human history with the good news of his holiness and his salvation. Now, if you've ever been to a revival, a scheduled revival, or a meeting called a revival, how would you know that it was ever even a revival? And how will Zechariah and Elizabeth know that what they've been praying for and his descendants have been praying for for 400 years, and now he says, John the Baptist is going to be your son, he's going to be the forerunner, he's going to turn the people's hearts from the world and turn them to make them prepared for the Lord's coming. 
And if we are talking about revival in this sense in our day, what is it that we should be praying for? Listen, I believe it's the same thing. We should be praying that God would turn our hearts toward Him to make us ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. We are here to be prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing right this very moment. We are preparing for the coming. Well, how will we know that we are a people ready for the Lord? Well, I think that Zechariah and Elizabeth are pretty good pictures here, but let me just give you some, some things that you should look for if we're talking about true revival. When John the Baptist comes under, on the scene and starts preaching repentance, here's what are some of the elements that happen. The people of God, Israel, comes under deep conviction of their sin. When John the Baptist is preaching out in the wilderness, he's saying, turn, you brood of vipers, you wicked people. And even though the religious leaders are still hypocrites, there's a great number of Israel who says, what must we do? Tell us what we must do. We want to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. What must we do? And in his preaching of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, he's telling them, turn, turn. And the people are falling under a deep conviction for their sins. Secondly, his people don't just fall under deep conviction. They turn from their sins, which is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. And I dare say to you that a great number of times in my own experience and maybe in many other experiences, when we have that so-called revival meeting, when we have that so-called church temporary experience, we feel absolutely guilty as all get out in the church building and 48 hours later we do absolutely nothing about what we felt guilty for. But in that day... John the Baptist is preaching, and the people get right. They have genuine repentance. They have true, genuine repentance. But let me tell you something else that happened in that particular moment when John the Baptist was preaching, and they were preparing the people uh, for the, to make ready them for the Lord. It, the, the third thing that's a clear element here is there's a recovery of a delight for biblical truth. Especially the truth when John the Baptist is preaching about how sinners are unholy and God is holy. There is a regard for the truth that God is set apart and we are wicked. In other words, John the Baptist's preaching was not a patty cake self-esteem driven, feel better type message at all. And in the end, end of this, with John the Baptist as the forerunner making a people ready for the Lord, there was definitely a renewed sense of God's presence, of God's power, of God's holiness, and of God's truth. But you know what happened? If you read through the account of the Gospels, you're going to see this as it spells out. Even though the religious leaders keep dwelling into their hypocrisy, what's interesting is that this truth and holiness and power and presence of God inevitably spills out of the church into the world into many genuine conversions. This true making the people ready for the Lord and then the coming of the Lord, there is this glorious outpouring through the true church, the true people of God, to live their lives in such a way that there's a genuine conversion. Now when it comes to revival, when it comes to a making a people ready for the Lord, John Blanchard said it like this, man can no more organize revival than he can dictate the wind. And that's absolutely true. 
You can't schedule it. You can't stick a banner up on the front of the church building and think that God's going to show up because you scheduled something. That's foolish. It's foolish to think that we can orchestrate a visitation of God. But I don't want to deal with th that part of it as much as I want to deal with John the Baptist's emphasis of making the people ready for the Lord. Making the people ready for the Lord. We would say it like this. Are you ready for the Lord to come? If he shows up today, are you sad about it? Are you embarrassed about it? What are you, when John the Baptist is going to be this guy who makes people ready for the Lord, What's that look like? What's that going to be? As I said, we can't schedule revival. We can't schedule his visitation to us. And by visitation, we don't mean some kooky, weird, fall on the floor, ghostly, mystical bullcrap. We're talking about a renewed sense that God is with us. We're talking about a renewed sense that God is for us. How do we get to that position? Well, even though we can't schedule it, and we have no clue when the Lord is going to do something like that, but at the same time, we do have to prepare for it. So I want to just walk through the text, highlight some things that I think are there that can help us understand this notion. Number one, God is sovereign in bringing revival. He is sovereign. Now, I listen, I, I'm a, I'm a, first I want to confess to you. After I heard and read that Zechariah and Elizabeth are like the other Israelites who for 400 years have not even heard from the Lord, I'm convicted because I don't spend a great deal of time saying, God... Would you visit us? Now, when I'm ticked off at the world, I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maybe you do too. But I don't spend a lot of time saying, God, would you just make us so aware of your presence and you being with us? Would you do that in such a way that it's unmistakable? And would you spill it over into us living holy lives and telling the gospel to people so that the desire of all nations would come to you? God is sovereign in it, and he takes the initiative. He, he did it in, remember in 1 Samuel 3 when the Bible says that the word of the Lord was rare and visions were rare, and God spoke, and Hannah had had that miraculous birth of Samuel. And the Lord spoke to him, spoke to him. So God sovereignly takes the initiative in revival. But I want you to notice something else about this text that I think spills out clearly. God often waits until the times are dark and the times are hopeless before he truly sends that revival or that visitation or that clearness of his presence. God often waits until it's dark, difficult, hopeless, before he sends revival. Is that the case in this passage? It is. Zechariah and Elizabeth are living in some weird times, politically messy, religiously confused, economically very, very rich or very, very poor. It's messy. Dark times. And one of the darkest times that I can think in my lifetime as far as for the Word of God, particularly in America, particularly in America, I don't think this is happening in Kenya. I don't think this is happening right now in Senegal. I definitely don't think this is happening in Papua New Guinea. But in America, 
There is a political mess. There is religious confusion and religious just mess. And the, probably the most subtle thing that happens to the church is for us to be convinced by Satan himself that if we'll just vote correctly, we'll get ourselves out of this mess. And listen, we, we just have to call a spade a spade. We have to call it straight. While you should use your exercise of voting, while you should use your citizen rights, absolutely. But don't you ever get caught up into thinking that a party's going to rescue us. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. On most days, let me just be honest with you, on most days, we refer to the Catholic Church as a cult. And we're happy that seven of our, just, of our nine justices are Catholic, which is a part of a cult. How am I talking? Real life? Real life. Now, am I happy that somebody might be able to turn over Roe versus Wade? Heck yeah! But what's the motivation? What's the reasoning? What's the purpose? And if we reach the promised land politically, is it brighter? Folks, listen, one of the most dangerous things that we can be given is everything that we want. I'm telling you, it's dark days. Dark because we think they're going to be bright. And I'm telling you, I'm starting to pray even more that this be one of those dark moments, just like in Zechariah and Elizabeth's day, where God, would you make us prepared to see the Lord? Would you make us ready to meet the Lord? Would you make us ready so that if God were to reveal Himself in a, in a strong way to sense His presence, to know His, He is with us, would you make us in such a way that we wouldn't mistake it? The third thing I'll tell you about this text that I think is clear to see is that God brings that kind of revival, that kind of visitation through his faithful remnant. Through his faithful remnant. Who did he bring this visitation through? Those who were already being faithful to him. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Already being faithful to the Lord. Already worshiping him. The Bible says they were blameless. The Bible says they were righteous in his sight. He's going to use them I wonder, will it be us? Not so that we can gloat in ourselves, but are we making ourselves prepared for the Lord? I, I realize that all of us are sinners and we're going to fall short and there's going to be some things He's going to have to clean up on us all the time. But are we even striving to be ready for the Lord? The text says that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in His sight. Verse number 6 says they were walking blamelessly in the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. We must be righteous. We must be set apart. We must be repentant of all of our sins. But here's the big thing. We must literally be prepared to meet the Lord himself. Now, at the risk of sounding like I'm taking you down an emotional basket case moment, I want to just be very honest with you. And you be honest with yourself. If the Lord were to come right at this moment, right now, as he will come in, in the Gospel of Luke, he will come and visit the people, and John the Baptist is there to say, make ready the way for the Lord. Here he is. If he were to show up now, are you ready? Are you ready? He said, well, yeah, I, I, I think I am. What do you mean? If you have to wonder what I mean, 
I don't know that you're ready. If you have to wonder about it, I'm not really sure that we're ready. Are we repentant of sins? Are we serious about living for the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about being a part of a cult. I'm not talking about everybody moving a trailer to get out of debt over here to the barn. I'm not talking about being in a fence in a commune area. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting serious about sin, serious about your walk with Jesus. If you keep telling me, yeah, I need to read the Word of God more, but you never do, what's the deal? If this sin keeps bothering you, you do nothing about it, you don't put yourself in an accountability spot where you can be changed by that and confronted with that, and you're bothered because you don't come to Sunday school, you're bothered because you don't do this, but you do nothing about it. That's insanity. What what are we doing? Are, Are we even serious? And if the Lord came today, You'd say, yeah, I I, I knew I should have done that. Yeah, you do. Do it. Make ready a people for the Lord. Get ready. In the days of Herod, it was crazy. In the days of 2020 in America, it's kind of crazy. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. If you get serious for the Lord Jesus Christ, prepare yourself. Not Not that I'm super duper serious. I need to be serious more than than just like you guys. But prepare for the onslaught of crazy comments. They they come just when you do simple things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Go share the gospel with your neighbor. I promise you, two of your neighbors will think you're called into the ministry. Yes or no? Well, I just, I just feel this urge to tell people about Jesus. You're going to be in missions. You're going to be in missions. I can see it. Well, why is that? Because nobody around here does that. Nobody tells people about Jesus. That's for people in missions. Man, I just want to read the Bible. Oh, you, you're going to be a preacher. We've become so subnormal that when Christians act normal, Everybody thinks it's abnormal. That's how messed up it is. Well, are you ready for the Lord Himself to come? A very basic message. I think that's the essence of the text. Make a people ready for the Lord. We've been waiting 400 years, Lord, for you to come, and you're coming. And you're coming, but you're not just coming guns blazing. You're giving us a forerunner. You're giving us someone ahead of the visitation of the Messiah. And how gracious of the Lord to do that. Get ready. Jesus is coming. Get ready. He's coming. I read an illustration that was very, very pointed to me in regards to people getting ready or looking forward to the coming of the Lord. It was many years ago at a place called the Shepherd's Home for Children with Developmental Disabilities. And all the time, they would teach these developmental disabled children. They would tell them nearly every day that Jesus, one day, would save them from all of their disabilities and would make everything right. I believe they were telling him the truth. You agree? And the director of this place, the Shepherd's Home for Children, when he was asked one day, he said, what's the biggest problem that you have at your facilities? 
He said, man, it's no doubt dirty windows. I said, what? Dirty windows. And he said, the reason is because they told those disabled children constantly that one day the Lord Jesus was going to come and make all things new, make all things right. And he said the biggest problem was dirty windows because the disabled children would press their hands, their noses, and their lips against the windows, always looking every day to see if today might be the day that Jesus would return to them and take them home and heal all their disabilities. You talk about having your priorities in the right place. Looking unto Jesus. And what a day that will be. What if that day were today? Are we making ourselves ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you something. If disabled, developmentally struggled children know the author and finisher of their faith that well that they look every day pressing their faces against the windows knowing that today may very well be the day. How have we gotten so smart that we are so stupid? Not looking for this being the day. I'm no prophet, no son of a prophet. I don't know if it's going to be today. But I'm telling you, I'm bothered that I don't live each day like it's going to be today. And as sure as my heart's desire is to change and make myself ready, I know that in and of myself it will not happen. But by the Spirit of God and through His Word, I'm looking forward to it happening not just to me, but to every one of us. And if that looks abnormal, I could give a crap less. I pray God worked the same thought in your heart. The bottom line is this. The days are dark, but the Lord Jesus could come at any moment. Let's pray together. As you ponder what's been said, I pray that the Lord will take the words that have been said, burn them in our hearts, And the Lord would work up whatever application is necessary for each of our own lives. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and the thought of Him coming back, the thought of His return is rattling you, then let me say to you that unless Jesus Christ has paid for your sins on the cross and your trust is totally in him you will pay for your sins for all of eternity in a place called hell I pray you know him Father thank you for the opportunity to come together to meet around your word I pray God that we have a sense of what's going on in the life of Zachariah and Elizabeth and their hopes for Messiah to come and their knowledge now of a forerunner, making a people prepared for the Lord. I pray, God, that in the same sense, we would hear the preaching of your word, we would be genuine in repentance, and we would be serious in preparing for the day of the Lord. And when you come, I pray you find us ready. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.